In the words of our esteemed Dean, Susan Nelson, I am pleased this evening to welcome you to the inauguration of Roland Faber to the Kilsby family John B. Cobb Jr. Chair in Process Studies. This evening promises to be rich in many ways, and I invite you to let it stir you with glockenspiel and poetry and theopoetic justice. Roland Faber came on my wavelength as a visiting scholar from Austria in 1995 and 1996. In 2006, he was invited to join the CST faculty as professor of process theology, and in 2007 was awarded tenure. Tonight, we celebrate with Roland this new chair that affirms the importance of process thought as it continues to emerge under his leadership. So welcome to this event, and afterwards, join us for a reception in the Mud Theater lobby. Well, I would like to add my welcome to all of you who have come for this great event. For me personally, it is a milestone and one of the most joyful occurrences of my life. So I think you will all understand why I speak this way. I have given much of my life to process thought and to trying to keep it alive, develop it, and change it. And when, uh, and that was no particular problem when I retired, two of my students, in fact three I think, were actually on the faculty and process thought, had an excellent life in the school and uh, we didn't worry too much about it. But it's thus far, the Center for Process Studies has simply been a faculty project. And if, the cent if there is no one on the faculty who wants to maintain this project, it has no basis for continuation. Now, for me personally, of course, it's very important that this continue. But I want to make the claim the reason it's important to me is because I judge it has a wider importance for the world and for the church. So let me just say a word about that. During the time that we have had the Center for Process Studies, what was almost exclusively a Protestant North American movement has become a global movement. And yet, Claremont remains the center of this global movement. Now, it's my opinion that if the thought of Whitehead could replace in the universities of the world the dominance of Cartesian and Kantian thought, that there could be a healthy renewal of the vitality not only of Christianity but of other of the great traditions of the world. We are, of course, as Christians, especially interested in the Christian part of that. But I think that spreading a word that can have a healing effect in many aspects of culture is itself a Christian activity, even apart from its effect on the Christian community and the Christian church. Now, one of the reasons that I have confidence that if we can keep this going, it will continue to have value for others throughout the world, is that the process tradition that began under other names back in the late 19th century at Chicago has changed frequently. Originally, it was called a socio-historical school. Then it became the theological expression of radical empiricism. Then it came to be called neo-naturalism. And after I had become a part of this community, the name was changed by Bernard Lumer to process theology. So I woke up one morning and discovered that I was a process theologian. <laughs> Later, he tried to change it again, but not quite successfully. He wanted to call it process relational thought. Well, 
during the latter part of this period, Whitehead has been the central figure, though not followed by all process folk. It is the Whiteheadian form of process thought that has come to Claremont, and it is also the connection with Whitehead that has made it a global movement. That all of this now has been appropriated by the school as such as a indefinite, I won't say forever, that, that, that's a, but for the indefinite future as a part of the school's mission and life is for me a wonderful joy when we realized how precarious was the future of process thought in Claremont, we also recognized the importance of having a chair. And the trustees, I believe because of Marjorie Suhaki's initiative, had already authorized the chair, but no one had done anything about raising money for it, and we just expect manna to drop from heaven sometime. But under these circumstances, the Center for Process Studies took on the responsibility, and I'm very much indebted to all of the staff, especially Janine Sletter, for all the work that they did in this process. The first person outside of Claremont who I talked to about this was Mary Ellen Kilsby. She had been a friend for many years, and she had been a supporter of the Center, and she had some wisdom about how these things happened. Mary Ellen and Bud made a generous gift, but they also gave extensively of their time and effort. They would drive up from Long Beach to join us for our committee meetings in order to raise money. The Laos are here, and they were another major supporter of us in the early days. John Buchanan was another major supporter, and John Forney. I wanted all those folks to know how much we appreciate it. And then in Wenatchee, Washington, the Brazis got a whole group of people to work together to give us support. There were many wonderful experiences that we had and they climaxed in a banquet that some of you may have attended. But even after all of that, we were at least six or seven hundred thousand dollars short of the amount of money that we needed. And frankly, there was a period of discouragement. But then I discovered that the development office here, which had been very helpful to us all along, had been in conversation with Mary Ellen Kilsby, and that conversation resulted in the establishment of the Chair of Process Studies here in Claremont. I cannot express fully how grateful I am to all those who were involved in making this happen and my confidence that process thought is about to go through or has already started going through another major transition. What was once a North American movement and expressed North American culture is now being led by a man from Austria who is a Catholic. <laughs> I think this is a healthy expression of the changes that it must go through in a constantly changing world. It would not be process thought if we didn't pay some attention to the processes that surround us with their radical changes. But let me say one more thing. I've spoken of these repeated changes, but there's something about process thought that means change doesn't abandon what has been done in the past. The socio-historical school is still important to us. Radical empiricism is still important to us. Neo-naturalism is still important to us. And what we've been calling more recently process thought is still important to us. But now, under Roland's leadership, it will look different and it will be different. And it will be in the avant-garde of new developments rather than simply continuing old patterns. I'm grateful to Roland for having taken the risk of leaving Austria to come here without any guarantee of tenure. And I'm grateful to the school for having recognized so quickly that this was a man they wanted to keep even if there wasn't a chair. Thank you to all of you for being here. <laughs> Thank you.
It's both my honor and pleasure to introduce the Poet Laureate for this evening's inauguration ceremony, Dr. Christina Hutchins. Christina currently serves as an adjunct faculty member at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, where she teaches courses in process thought, UCC theology, as well as poetry and poetics. She holds degrees from UC Davis, Harvard Divinity School, and received her doctorate from the Graduate Theological Union. In addition to her academic essays on process thought and queer and feminist theory, her poems have appeared widely in a number of literary journals, including the Antioch Review, the Beloit Poetry Journal, the Denver Quarterly, and the New Republic, among others. Her anthologized poetry includes a long 18-page poem in the volume God, Literature, and Process Thought, published by Ashgate. Some of the many honors she has received have been the 2009-2010 Missouri Review Editor's Prize, two Barbara Deming Awards for Poetry, as well as the Via Montavo Poetry Prize. Her poetry books include Collecting Light, published by Acacia Books, and The Stranger Dissolves, forthcoming from 16 Rivers Press. A new manuscript entitled World Without has been a finalist for the Dorset Prize, the Colorado Prize, the New Issues Prize, and the National Poetry Series. Christina's doctoral dissertation, entitled Departure, Using Judith Butler's Agency and Alfred North Whitehead's Value to Read Temporality Anew, reads moments of rupture in the actual world towards or as essential expansions of felt relation. She currently lives in Albany, California, where she was recently reappointed for a second term as the city's first poet laureate. Christina also happens to be the professor who introduced me, almost 10 years ago now, to process theology and the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead in the context of her adventurously creative introductory class. As her former student, I can testify to Christina's unique pedagogical practice of some of the deepest insights of process thought truly embodying in her teaching style the idea that the living, relational God of process must be met in forms of expression, not limited to linguistic ones, woven with a color, harmony, verb, and open-ended creativity of a genuine poetics. Without any further ado, let us welcome Poet Laureate Christina Hutchins. Thank you, Luke. That was a fun class. <laughs> I'm glad to be here to be part of this celebration, so thank you for asking me, Roland, and for being the theologian that you are. And I'm glad also that this honors you, John. It's a, it's a wonderful event. Um, I'm going to read three poems without any remarks about them. The one thing I will say is that if you're not especially used to hearing poetry, just relax um, and let the sort of the music of it wash over you. These, I suppose, are Whitehead influenced poems as probably everything I write is. Into Your Pocket. Into Your Pocket. I have slid a bright morning before rain. Tonight's concerto is folded into thousands of paper cranes. Their wings were trees rollicking restless in the sun. Here's a loose black thread pulled from my hem, tangled to a tiny bundle between my fingers and thumb, kelp strands roiled back and forth in the surf and deposited at high tide. The lost chains of underseas are knotted, left along the beach. Here is the warmth of my stride, left in a heap on a rug beside the bed, blue jeans shed in the shapes of my legs. I too have held the shape of an absence, quiet in the auditorium. Who is that laughing at the back of the room? Here we are again, leaning against the door, my way to you disclosed by two tongues, spending a sweet moment. 
The self I become and the self you become our celestial bodies entered into one by another. Tender release, a wet palate tasting its small flourishes, my love is for taking along. Like you, I swim a rising astral surge. If we are anchored by every spent moment, the anchors are already rusted to dust, and these chains no heavier than light. This one's called Wednesday Afternoon, and I will say I wrote this at work when I was supposed to be doing other work. It's the only way you get paid as a poet. <laughs> Wednesday Afternoon. <clears throat> Driving uphill, the beams of the day perch warm on the thighs of my jeans. Behind me, so many suns climb the hill, one entire sun to every windshield. Together they rise like the trumpet section, who when they stand, press brass to their lips and will their bodies to bellows. Right foot on the brake, left on the clutch. I might sit at this stop sign forever, and I think I know that woman crossing in front of me. At least I know her stride. She loves whatever she carries, and her hair, loose, is just so much another tree, full-leaved with wind as she turns down the hill. I know she must hear the vernal rush, intimate, beside her ears. If we are rafts, one for another's glory, clearly it is her turn to be hoisted high and into the boat, vested with blooms and metals, every small sun lifted from its slant of glass and set upon her breast. All our uncaged yearnings, even my want of you, are small birds flying to nest in the auburn leaves of a head so bold. It's abandoned anxiety over the top of the rise and now purposefully is bearing us down toward the root of the hill. Like rain, both the quick and the dead gather there. And this last one is the one that I think Roland especially likes. It's called Wheels. For 12 million years, in an interstellar cloud, a steadfast electron rode around the velodrome of its atom. And for eons, too, a tight nucleus orbited the axis of itself. Then suitcase wheels rolled down Wolf Dietrichstrasse. Bicycle wheels flashed below a girl. She stands to pedal. Under the red wheelbarrow in rain, Ezekiel's fire trundles through mud. A whisper is a wheel, and translation, time turning away from notions of an isolate self. I dreamt my beloved wheeled two lazy fingers round my breast, amid billows and waves, cotton worn so thin, it tears with the mere turn of our bodies, one around the other. Unseen, minute whirlwinds have tumbled down both arms of the pianist and charged struck strings have set wheels to the air they travel. A striding boat unwinds lines of the fisher's reels. Perhaps is a tumbleweed, loose and ahead of a storm, 
My typewriter's carriage return and ribbon spools, gyres of a new poem. Thunder is the heavenly weight of rolling joy. Like revolutions of waves twisting up the sands and of the shores spinning back away, atria and ventricles wheel tides of restive blood. Even the rolling pin of your diaphragm and rib, an empty bottle pushed along our street by wind, twirls under it the glassy shadow sounding praises of being hollow and on the way. Carnival wobble, a frisbee loosed by the snap of a wrist, catch if you can. If the wheels and electron appear wet, momentum of spin, and if by the not yet, it's lured to leap and change direction, quantum release. A hospital's revolving door turns out a brand new guest. She's carried in tangible arms, turned turning weird, turning and tangent. And suddenly this steep hills a wheel under the children's escaping ball. Timber rotates in dark surf. Earth is both spindle and a spoke spun round the sun, and our galaxy is a mixing wheel of lights, changeling, love.
I feel I should either sing or be silent. Really, I could hardly be more honored and happy than this to be able to add my voice to this moment and this music, this event of the inauguration of the Kilsby family and John B. Cobb, Jr. Chair in Process Studies. Of course, chair is a rather sedentary metaphor, isn't it, for the sort of thought that we're enthroning today? A philosophical theology of infinite mobility and of metamorphic multiplicity. Nonetheless, process theology had found a stunning scale of stable persistence by way of the path-breaking brilliance of John Cobb with David Griffin and Marjorie Sue Hockey and then a whole growing collective, he built a sturdy center so hospitable in its becomings and so becoming in its relations as to have produced the terra firma for a chair, a seat. According to historian Gary Dorian, who's not part of it, Process theology comprises the only true school of liberal progressive theology alive today. That it is, it's not just a movement, but a school through which the great social movements flow. Tonight we celebrate the first occupancy of this chair, 
by one who has already manifest his own formidably persistent, indeed insistent, creativity. He has been invited in his own multiplicity to have a seat here. Of course, when he first came, there were probably those who wondered, you know, who is this Austrian theologian anyway, just waltzing in here from Vienna? <laughs> well, I had first met Roland Faber at the third International Process Conference in Claremont. I think it was three, right? Not two. Three. It was four already? Oh, my. I first met Roland Faber at the fourth International Process Conference in Claremont, 1998 when I found I was not the only theologian to interweave recent French philosophy with Whitehead. I also met our poet laureate there, just beginning that dissertation that was the oracle for the 2009 Butler event. And there was a young Dr. Professor Faber presenting on deontologizing God, Levinas, Deleuze, and Whitehead. We had uh, both found Deleuze, who found Whitehead half a century earlier, and honorifically dubbed his cosmos the chaosmos. Because of this confluence, the book Process and Difference came forth. Roland and I had independently recognized that process theology can't beat post-structuralism, uh, but we also can't just join it. Uh, not at any rate without the mutual adjustments now very much in process. I have learned so much since from Roland Faber's perichoretic waltz between Whitehead continental philosophy and Christian theology that I don't know uh, where it ends and my work begins. Of course, his work does not end, but it does draw its beginnings from uh, the depths of the Christian tradition. Indeed, Faber in Catholic Austria faithfully followed the ancient pathway of reasoned and mystical subversion. For example, while he was still professor at the Catholic faculty in Vienna, he'd arranged for me to teach an intensive. The last minute, the cardinal's office ordered me uninvited. I don't know why, I never said anything against the cardinal. But, so Professor Faber proceeded in rather Jesuitical style to quietly reroute funds and had me teach the seminar on Protestant property. <laughs> well, soon Roland got the radically ecumenical call to this other patch of Protestant property. But let me do this with due decorum. Roland Faber had completed his dissertation in systematics and published it in 1992. You know, all the while, during those years, racking up some of the top prizes in Austria for composers. Austria. In 1996, he spent a year at the Center for Process Studies. In 1997, he presented and published his Habilitationsschrift, Prozess, Relativität und Transcendenz. In 1999, he was appointed Extraordinary University Professor. Now, it was in 2001, he edited Whitehead's Harvard Lecture of 2526, based on Hartshorn's notes. You know, talk about paying your process dues. 2003 saw his fifth book published, Gott als Poet der Welt. It would be released in English translation in 2008 and a good translation it is. God as the poet of the world performs a polyvocal style all its own. In fact, it opens with voices, 14 literal letters that he solicited defining process theology. Some of the writers are here, such as John Cobb and John Quiring. Through waves of textual interaction, mapping the whole history and field of process theology, Faber unfolds pardon me, magisterially, the complex world of his theology as theopoetics. It was in 2005 that he became professor of process theology at the Claremont School of Theology and professor of religion at the Claremont Graduate University 
excellent choice. There is no more brilliant, profound, exacting, and exciting thinker in theology today. But I want to read you a few titles from his essays, just a few, since they threaten to multiply like cobs, uncountably. The titles read like a poem of their own. The Infinite Movement of Evanescence, the Pythagorean puzzle in Plato, Deleuze, and Whitehead, or Apocalypse in God on the Power of God in Process Eschatology, Whitehead at Infinite Speed, Deconstructing System as Event, Oh, Bitches of Impossibility. Oh. Oops, uh, I think that one is about uh, difficult canine breeding practices. <laughs> God in the Making. Adventures of the Spirit, my vision for the Center for Process Studies. The Crisis of Becoming, Reflections on a Whiteheadian Spirituality. Eco-theology, eco-process, and eco-theosis, a theopoetical intervention, a recent one and one of my particular favorites. But I must, by way of advertising, mention his Bodies of the Void, Theophilia and Theoplicity, which is a high point of the recent, the most recent Drew Transdisciplinary Theological Colloquium volume, which is just out, called Apophatic Bodies. And look for his contribution to our forthcoming volume, edited by Laurel Schneider and me, called Polydoxy, Theology of Multiplicity and Becoming. His piece, like Monica Coleman's in the same volume, bubbles up from the molten core of our project. Of course, his own anthologies are starting to pour forth from the exciting work of the new Whitehead Research Project, which he initiated in 2006 to supplement and complement the work of the Center for Process Studies. So, Event and Decision, Ontology and Politics in Badiou, Deleuze, and Whitehead is coming out this year, as is also Secrets of Becoming, Negotiating Whitehead, Deleuze, and Butler. Two more are in the pipeline flowing from WRP events. But it is his new book about to appear called The Divine Manifold as it builds on God as poet of the world, which unfolds the programmatic presuppositions of this event and this conference for the next couple of days. The inspiration of that divine poet will be manifest and manifold, I have no doubt, in tonight's inaugural lecture, The Opoetic Justice Toward an Ecology of Living Together. Let's give Roland Faber not just a chair, but a hand. <laughs> Good afternoon. I hope you have a good time. That's about to change. <laughs> you have to listen to me for an hour, and I will torture you with that. But I have some gimmicks coming up, so that will kind of help you a little bit through it, as you'll see very soon. Before I begin, and especially in this community, I want to mention something else that happened this week, a tragic event. The wife of our president, Jerry, Vida Campbell, died unexpectedly, and under tragic circumstances, she was not older than 64 years. So my thoughts go out to both of them, and out of respect and love for both, I would ask you to remain in silence for a second. Thank you. It is a great honor to stand today before you and to accept and to fill this new chair in process studies 
with the promise of a friendship. A friendship with processed thought and processed thinkers that once 15 years ago brought me to Claremont in the first place and that claimed me ever since. This very claim has struck others before me and will, in my own voice, always attempt to invoke a future for its promise. I mean to say, there is a condition without which we would not be here today or not under the same auspices, the immense work of John Cobb, or as he is known among his friends, John B. Cobb, Jr. <laughs> and the trust of Marian Kilsby and her family in this work and its future. There are many others who have contributed to this realization of trust, and I thank you at this point for doing so. I can only do justice to their investment in the future process studies through the means of my own work, which in its turn will have to trust in an inspiration that only the future will reveal. I remain, so to say, committed to its revelations. This inaugural lecture is an impossibility. It is inspired by a manifold of concerns and itself such a manifold as twisted as the history that made this occasion possible and to which it is obli obligated. That you, members of the board, my colleagues, my students, and the community of Claremont and the Claremont School of Theology have entrusted me with a professorship in process theology almost five years ago and allowed me to make Claremont my home. That my inquiries led to questions that still occupy me questions of meaning and multiplicity, of cosmic vastness and the fragility of the living and the dead, and of what hinders the discourse on the divine to disappear as an illusion in a world of despair. That a concept became dear to me many years ago, Theopoetics, from my book on the poet of the world to my first lecture here, which was titled process thought as theopoetics, to the upcoming current conference on theopoetics and divine manifold for which dear colleagues and friends have graciously gathered. That Whitehead's work ignites my imagination and curiously relates with my post-structuralist leanings and existential inclinations. Though it is impossible for one lecture to give all of these impulses due attention, I will try to gather them not as a final unity, but as a manifold in fluid motion, in the midst of an inescapable finitude and inspired by an infinitude beyond. To be in the middle, to become intermezzo in the flow of things is a virtue I have learned from Gilles Deleuze. To be guided by it feels right. It feels like trusting in what Whitehead calls the rightness in the nature of things. This rightness is my theme today. I must also not fail to mention that this occasion and its theme recall another anniversary. On this very date, April 22nd, 1941, Whitehead gave his last public lecture titled Immortality. I understand my thoughts as comments on his, namely how to imagine that no activity is merely a passing whiff of insignificance because it passes into permanent significance for the universe. Let me explain this theme with three witnesses, each accidentally or fittingly commenting on the other. It is in Shakespeare's last work, The Tempest, that one of his most famous poetic renderings occurs. In the mouth of Prospero, the benevolent but haunted magician who fled to an island of an attempt on his life in the moment in which he forgives his adversaries and sacrifices his magical realm of spirits to become human. He offers this famous insight into the fragility of human significance within the scheme of things. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air, and like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers 
the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all which it inherit, shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a wreck behind. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. The dream, the sleep, our little lives, the vastness of contingency, what is their significance? We feel the urgency of this question remaining. Charles Olson, in his poem on Whitehead, gives us this vision of the fragile dream that we are and that all is. In English, the poetics became movables, furniture, thereafter. After 1630 and Descartes was the value until Whitehead, who cleared out the gunk by getting the universe in as against man only. What we know went on, the dream, the dream being self-action with Whitehead's important corollary that no event is not penetrated in intersection or collision with an eternal event. The poetics of such a situation are yet to be found out. Universal passage without any claim for humanity, the collision with the eternal event, fragility, ecological breadth, theopoetics. The search for significance of the fleeting dreams of existence in the community of existence became the motive of Whitehead's illumination of the very ability to live together. Listen to the closing paragraphs of Whitehead's last book, Modes of Thought. It reads like a philosophical testament. The use of philosophy is to maintain an active novelty of fundamental ideas illuminating the social systems. It reverses the slow descent of accepted thought toward the inactive commonplace. If you like to phrase it so, philosophy is mystical. For mysticism is direct insight into depths as yet unspoken. But the purpose of philosophy is to rationalize mysticism, not by explaining it away, but by the introduction of novel verbal characterizations, rationally coordinated. Philosophy is akin to poetry, and both of them seek to express that ultimate good sense which we term civilization. Philosophy, ecology, mysticism, poetics, and the future of civilization, these are the ingredients of Whitehead's exploration of living together in the midst of the flow of things and with the question of the significance of this passage in mind. I will begin by asking how process studies relate to this quest, how they illuminate togetherness, which is always already ecological in nature, how this philosophical question resonates with poetics and mysticism, and in what sense these connections express an adventure in civilization. At this point, a new question will arise, the question of justice. As it reflects back on poetics, ecology, and process thought, and as it leaves a theopoetic trace in the search for resources for an ecology of living together. So what is process studies? This is one of the impossible questions. It is like asking, what is life? Nevertheless, we ought to be, say, ought to be able to say something, and this something is a negation and a position. Process studies, I say, is not the studies of processes, nor is it equivalent with the assertion that everything is process. Rather, it indicates that everything is studied from the perspective of, gets even more complicated, processuality. But what does processuality mean? One of the most relevant answers came, comes from uh, Whitehead's The Principle of Relativity, which is famous for the quarrel with Albert Einstein. Its second chapter, the relatedness in nature suggests that processuality means that we experience, think, and live under the presupposition that there is no totality. No totality as such of things, of concepts, of perspectives, of existence, of imagination, of truth. 
This has profound implications, of which I will name only three. First, we find ourselves always in the middle of things, experiencing, thinking, acting from within an infinity of perspectives, always finite themselves, but always moments, elements, and factors that imply infinitely many other such moments, elements, and factors. They never add up to a whole, but always overflow into infinitely other and different connections. In other words, what is not a totality is always a movement or an event in the becoming of a multiplicity. This manifold is always diffused throughout some place and some time and with some character of its own by inherently implying many such times, places, and characters. This manifold is always in the process of becoming something, somewhere, sometime else, moving on passing into endless other constellations of possible actual connections. Second, something is happening somewhere and sometime. Wherever we focus on this moment, element, or factor in itself, when we stabilize it for our experience, knowledge, or orientation, we change its character from being a factor into that of a focus, as if it was a little totality in itself. We abstract it from its infinite background in which it was a moment in relation to infinitely other moments and emphasize its character as an individual in its own right. While in this focal procedure events gain singular importance, their identity has a price, namely the loss of being an intermezzo in the flow of things. Without totality, identity is a construct of emphasis but also a loss of connectivity. With an imaginative term of Alain Badiou, what is actually a concrescence, a growing together of multiplicity, transmutes into an excrescence, a hold, beyond becoming a procession of individuality. Third, processuality without totality does not deny individuality, rather it claims the inescapability of the contradiction between individuality and relationality. There is no smooth transition. A constitutive distance prevails. So if something was to happen at all, this distance must be bridged. But it can only be bridged momentarily for one moment establishing distance as difference within this happening. Whitehead's term for this movement of bridged opposition is creativity. It is not indicating a romantic gesture of sublime fusion, but the stress of surviving. These contradictions for one more moment by always being in peril of shipwreck, collapse, or death. It is this character of contradiction within the fleeting insignificance of occurrences by which the evolvement of a cosmos claims meaning without totality. The great beauty of order amid a cruel chaos of disturbances, and the great beauty of chaos amidst the cruel orders of stabilization. But listen, what's important? Nothing's important, except that the great and cruel mystery of the world of which this is part not be denied. This great refusal of totality in the affirmation of the great and cruel mystery of multiplicity with its inherently inherent sensitivity against any lingering totalitarianism distinguishes Whitehead's processuality from, for instance, Hegel's or Nietzsche's. There is no coquetting with the spirit in which processuality finds its totality, not even in the subtle form of an eternal return. Here Whitehead foreshadows Deleuze the only thing that eternally returns is the process of infinite becoming itself. There is no sustenance of sameness in the creative passage. No one underlies or overarches multiplicity. In a universe of processuality without totality, only intervals of contradictory connectivity prevail in their struggle for ever new individualization of intensity and structuring of harmony intervals of polyphony, if you want, venturing into ever new constellations of mutual exclusion and yet always in need of mutual patience. 
if processuality without totality is the perspective of process studies, the ultimate question might still resemble Heidegger's famous, why is there something rather than nothing? But the irritation it treasures is not that of sheer existence. It is that of togetherness from which existence ventures. There's no need to defer the ultimate reason for existence to nothingness. It comes forth in the midst of the great and cruel mystery of becoming together, ever anew, without origin, without end. This missing totality is not entrapping us in a world of insignificant finiteness with the flickers of becoming and vanishing, but it situates us in the middle of togetherness as intervals of its meaning. The affirmation of multiplicities of togetherness again presents us with the reason for the importance of the two other ingredients in Whitehead's philosophical testament quoted before, processuality's ecological character and poetic nature as living together and living in the middle. Both are grounded in a togetherness of multiplicity that undermines the Cartesian in the independence of realms of existence, such as those of the mind and science, ideas and phenomena, fact and fiction. Instead, multiplicities are always experiments, disturbances in the moment of their aesthetic togetherness. And they issue into ever new disturbances for ever new experiments. I turn to ecology first. Ecology is my word. Take me with that. Come in there. You'll find yourself in a firmless country, in motion, organic, interrelations. Living together as experimental togetherness without totality is the character of the ecological credo of Whitehead's organic philosophy. It cannot completely be divorced from its poetic nature. As the notion of ecology does not arise before the 1860s, its ancestry, Donald Worcester claims, harbors the bifurcation between an Arcadian line found in the organicism of Thoreau and Whitehead and an imperial line associated with Francis Bacon. Although ecology is commonly understood as the study of the relation of organisms and their environments, the inherent split remains active especially between environmental sciences and environmental ethics or activist movements such as land ethics and deep ecology. Since Whitehead does not accept this split as original, but as already undermined by aesthetic experimentation, he also continuously avoids any strict boundaries set by any mode of knowledge or practice. This avoidance is the recognition of the poetic nature of ecology, experimenting with multiplicity from within, from the middle of it. Nature, for Whitehead, is always the experience of nature, of which we, experimenting with the experience, are an intermezzo, part, partner, and participant. We exist, experience, and know, act, only because of the patience of a processual nature for the appearance and passage of events with such characteristics. This is the reason that Whitehead poetically establishes continuity between all seemingly self-excluding or totalizing imperial interests that build on hierarchies of realities, of which either God or science would be the highest, if not the only instantiation. In a surprising move of radical democratization of accesses, categories, and classifications, Deleuze calls it university, all of Whitehead's concepts speak with one voice that is only of the multiplicity of competing, oppositional, but mutually dependent instances of togetherness by cutting through any totalizing language as it establishes imperial hierarchies. This allows Whitehead to poetically undermine the hierarchical classifications such that his own conceptuality subversively begins to uncover processuality on all levels of ecological interaction. Whitehead universalizes the ecological perspective throughout all sciences and beyond to all levels of cosmic organization. It is by this poetic transfer of aesthetic experimentation throughout all levels of physical and mental, individual and social togetherness that his concepts of order and chaos 
society and individuality, event and character, demonstrate an astonishing universe of multiplicities of living together. Laws of nature connect with the character of persons. Human societies connect with those great societies of the universe like suns and stellar systems. Humans have a social character as have elementary particles. Societies can become persons as persons can become societies. And non-human societies such as animals are persons too. The ethical implications are virulent. If this poetic continuity of multiplicities expresses the fundamentally ecological character of all togetherness in the universe and if living together extends over all boundaries of living and non-living organisms, then human togetherness exhibits also a virtually infinite interiority of otherness. Human and non-human organisms and environments alike are as interior to our own living together as are we in an infinity of human and non-human organisms and environments. This poetic democratization of living together from the midst of ecological multiplicities does not exclude differences, but rather establishes them as disequilibria in aesthetic experimentation. Differences arise as the emergence of novel organisms and environments irreducible to their heritage. In this ecological economy of creative evolution, the poetic use of concepts for both humans and non-humans speak with the voice of processuality without totality. That is, such poetics does not presuppose any common essence or energy or form or matter or idea or substance, but only the common function of togetherness that always begins with a multiplicity of differences and interdependences in the fleeting intervals of their experimental togetherness. This is what Deleuze calls life. Life not bound by biology, but spread throughout the multiplicity of cosmic societies. Life not as a vitalistic force, as some would see creativity, but as the very disappearance of totality in the intervals that establish existence as unprecedented togetherness. If life is the multiplicity of, ex of experimental togetherness, its togetherness as multiplicity becomes the expression of its very meaning. Such ecology of living together has a radical implication. The, multi the multiplicity of processual experimentations lacks any external measure or criterion of their own justification other than the internal process of experimentation itself. Hence, we must let go of a deep-rooted illusion that our living together as humans and among non-humans is guided by any totality that there is any divine or cosmic pre-established order, original unity, or unifying purpose. If living together lacks any underlying reality, unity, or aim, this is what Whitehead actually means with creativity. Cosmic multiplicity then cannot seek any salvation beyond itself for all the pleasure and pain involvement and suffering it inherently produces. On the contrary, living together must become the living deconstruction of totalities in which we seek escape. Here, poetics gains an ecological function, countering the fear of creative passage and the desire for illusionary totalities that hinder living together. Poetry has one subject, impermanence, which it presents with as much permanence as possible. Poetics addresses living together as living in the middle of impermanence. It deconstructs the closures of totalities, or conversely, it invites an ecological opening. Thereby, poesy has an indispensable function in the formulation of an ecology of civilization. Let me explain this statement. Whitehead's philosophical interest in poetics has a profound impact on the workings of his cosmology. In science in the modern world, poetics functions as the very perspective of processuality that counters religious or scientific totalities. That is, the blind trust in either the judgment of God or the simplifications of mechanicism. 
by invoking the great serious poems of English literature, Whitehead demonstrates an experimentation with ecological togetherness that, especially in the Romanticism of Wordsworth, quote, started neither with God nor the methods of modern science, but with nature. That is, from the aesthetic impression of, quote, that mysterious presence of surrounding things which imposes itself on any separate element that we set up as individual for its own right. It is not as totality, but as connectivity that this mystery presents itself, as an evolutionary expansiveness of a multiplicity of organisms and environments in becoming. Poetics saves the aesthetic intuitions of this multiplicity beneath any simplifying totalities, as the place where the inherent conflict of aesthetic at the, uh, attainment resides. Do we seek the lower success for, of totality, or do we strive for higher aesthetic failure that releases multiplicity anew? Since poetics expresses Whitehead's profound conviction that all cosmic togetherness is aesthetic experimentation, it is no surprise that it reappears in Adventures of Ideas as an appeal for an ecological civilization. As with Bruno Latour's Politics of Nature, Whitehead's living together is always an invitation for humans and non-humans, and in its function to confront the polis with a democratic deconstruction of, the, of totalities and closures, poetics reverses its hierarchical imperialism that exchanges processuality with antagonisms as motives for war. Poesy counters the structures of creative synthesis with novel expressions that save the massive qualitative variety of reality from its exclusion on which such orders are built and transforms it into an unexpected uh, resource for new realizations. This poetics also underlies Whitehead's five characters of civilization. He names truth, beauty, art, adventure, and peace as they express processuality without totality as the togetherness of a polyharmonic intensity. In the conflicts of the creative disequilibrium of togetherness, poiesis transforms them into sites for the overcoming of their impasse. It is in this sense that Whitehead understands poiesis as divine and names God as the poet of the world. Poetics is always already theopoetics. Divine poetics is a sense of salvation of multiplicity in the deconstruction of simplicity, a poetic cut through all characters and individuals on every level of organic or environmental togetherness. It has not the character of power, but of a love of multiplicity, a polyphilia that releases the inhibitions as of conflicting totalities. In deep irony, Whitehead's theopoetics does not associate poetics with creativity, an association that the Council of Nicaea used to name the creator the poet of the world, Poetes Panton. On the contrary, Whitehead's divine poetics names a counter agency in the creative process that saves that which is excluded in the simplifications of creative synthesis. Divine poesis is a kind of inversion of the creative advance or a counter synthesis, diving into the dark, vast, infinite background, the depth of excluded and negated connectivity. It is a memory of lost multiplicity and a memento mori, a memory of death and a reenactment of the dead. Yet its salvation is not directed away from creative passage into an eternal termination of processuality, but toward a renewed aesthetic experimentation of the creative process. When Whitehead proclaims philosophy to be the endeavor to reduce Milton's Lycidas to prose, he invokes such a memento mori as did Milton's poem, a lamentation of his friend's accidental death. What connects this poem with the poetic counterprocess is that it does not project the salvation of the dead into heaven, but transforms it into a love of passage and the renewal of multiplicity in the creative passage. Listen to the very end of Milton's poem. 
while the still morn went out with the sandals gray. He touched the tender stops of the various quills with eager thought warbling his Doric lay. And now the sun had stretched out all the hills and now was dropped into the western bay. At last he rose and twitched his mantle blue, tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. It resonates with the ending of Whitehead's famous fifth part of Process and Reality on God and the World, and its juxtaposition of the creative passage and the poetic counter-process, or counter-passage, both moving conversely to each other. Like Walter Benjamin's weak messianic force, this poetic love of passage counters progress by opening the graves of the dead and the lost and the forgotten. It shocks the past, riddling it again with the ambiguity of life, snatching out fresh con uh, constellations of multiplicity against its death of forgetting. It has a living ally in Derrida's deconstruction and Judith Butler's performativity as they confront the reductive violence of synthesis and exclusion by which any order of things, as Foucault says, is established. Theopoetics is not poetry of God, an imagination of a divine in our image. Like Julia Christever's semiosis, it is rather a poetics that reminds us of the materiality we exclude from our regimes of meaning. With George Bataille, it leads us into the blinding depth of unspeakability that we share with animals. This poetics is the ecological deconstruction of creative orders in which the forgotten, repressed, and closed multiplicities come to life again. God is neither the object nor the subject of this poetics, but its mystery. The always yet unspoken depths of connectivity in which we renew our empathy with the excluded. Things are the God, you will love God, and not in vain. For what we love, we grow to it, we share its nature. At length, you will look back along the star's rays and see that even the poor, dull humanity has a place under heaven. Needless to say that that understanding of poetics is not without challenges. But it is in line with deep intuitions of Greek philosophy, Pythagoras' harmonics, Heraclitus' fragments, Aristotle's poetics, the first treatise of this kind. Nevertheless, Plato's Republic divorced poetics from philosophy and politics because its mimesis of mimesis leads away from truth and counter-associated philosophy with mathematics. For Whitehead, mathematics and poetry only lame different modes of the symbolic articulation of multiplicities. Others, however, such as Alain Badiou, have followed Plato and at times dismissed poetics as seeking nothing instead of truth. And they may have a point. The resistance against the poetic nature of philosophy could articulate a dangerous lack of aesthetic irresponsibility that has led Heidegger's poetic totality of being into visions of German supremacy, and Levinas against Heidegger to establish ethics as first philosophy. We might wonder whether Whitehead's aesthetic experimentation, even if it directly attacks any totality, contributes to such irresponsibility, if it indulges in harmonies of togetherness without engaging at least their justice. It is indeed a curious and alarming fact that Whitehead civilization is not concerned with justice at all. But can there be truth and peace without justice? Not that process studies have not discovered the silence and developed sensitive reactions, the works of John Cobb speak loudly and urgently on this matter. His work is saturated with questions of social and eco-justice and the search for the common good. Nevertheless, we are left puzzled with this silence. Maybe this puzzle only falls in place if we allow, or if we follow Whitehead's cosmology in the way it situates ethics. By being an ecological cosmology, it is not primordially concerned with humanity. Within the vastness of ecological relatedness, humanity is neither the crown 
nor the exception. It may be a serendipitous, yet not in any way a necessary evolution in the infinite series of cosmic epochs that might be vastly different in, in their character and even in their natural laws, if they share anything comparable at all. Hence, the particular ethical impulse of this ecological cosmology is uh, generated by its processuality without totality, expressing a care for matters of fact which are matters of concern, and the importance in the creation of the good and the bad that every event leaves behind. Ethics is about the ecological character of the cosmos. It is a kind of virtue ethics, similar to Plato's and Aristotle's or Foucault's and Butler's. So wouldn't there be a virtual place for justice, addressing the just character of living together? Whitehead's problem is that if this ecological character expresses processuality without totality, it cannot name any external or universal measure or criterion for any ethical categories, principles, or codes. Eco ecological polyharmonics always differs from organism to organism, environment to environment, yes, even event to event. Without any pre-stabilization of divine and cosmic orders or laws, the problem of such an imminent justice is not how to find universal principles or external criteria uh, as sought, for instance, by Kant, Mills, or Bentham, but how to address the very conflictual character of ecological becoming. So the question is, how to establish a character that heightens depth and intensity while at the same time releasing it into a creative passage that inspires life in all characters, orders, and laws. Beyond this ecological immanence, the hazy notion of justice in Plato's Republic, so says Whitehead, is nothing but the will of the stronger. Yet in the conflictual situation of living together, justice makes its appearance as an impulse that names how the world may always anew become cosmos, and that it can only become cosmos by, as he says, molding the general flux in its broken progress towards finer, subtler issues. Whitehead calls this imminent molding of the always conflictual character of ecological becoming into always noble cosmic character the conception of an essential rightness in nature. This justice names an almost profane concept of the goodness of God, as Whitehead says, how the ecological process of becoming cosmos can exhibit a character that suffers its injustices and judges every creature with a tender care that nothing be lost. This is Whitehead's concept of a poetic justice arising out of the very nature of things. It is not, as the literary device of poetic justice indicates, a, a censorship that guarantees the victory of the virtue and the downfall of vice. It is, as Whitehead says in one of my favorite passages, a companionship that transmutes what has been lost into a living fact, that offers a mirror which, in the light of its downfalls, discloses to every creature its own greatness. But wait. Does the world really show such a character? Does it exhibit such a divine virtue of rightness? And can we even conceptualize it? A concept is about how to look at the earth from the moon without ever getting there. The moon is about love and werewolves and also Poe. Poe is about looking at the moon from the sun or else the graveyard. Everything is about something if you're a thin movie producer chain smoking muggle the world is about overpopulation, imperial invasion, biocide, genocide, fratricidal war, starvation, holocaust, mass injury and murder, high technology, super science, atom, nuclear, neutron, hydrogen, detritus, radiation, compassion, Buddha, alchemy. Communication is about monopoly television, radio, movie, newspaper, spin on earth. That is planetary censorship, universe is about universe. Yeah, Ellen. 
Obviously, the problems begin when we are called to imitate such a justice of which we only know its lack, absence, and always unfulfilled urgency. How to imitate a justice that does not look for a law to satisfy, for injustices to be restored, or goods to be distributed equally, but that in any instance of ever or never ending experimentation calls to uncover the poetic character in which the universe is about universe. How to partake in a love for the cruel mystery of multiplicity that we can only hope transforms all injustices into a rightness in which all sufferings, sorrows, failures, triumphs, and immediacies of joy, all whitehead quotes, are woven into a harmony of a universal living together that is always immediate, always many, always one, always with a novel advance, moving onward and never perishing. Without criteria and principles, aren't we left puzzled again? If this is, was a permanently shifting character of theopoetic justice demands from a living together as an ecological civilization, what makes this ecological justice just? Let me try this. Poetic justice is neither primarily a legal nor an ethical matter, but the art of living together. It expresses the characteristics of ecological civilization truth, beauty, art, adventure, and peace, in light of the multiplicities it excludes. In other words, justice only becomes justice in the face of the places of its breakdown. And it becomes poetic justice in the imitation of its uh, messianic character in the moments of urgency that always calls for a transformation of the violence of exclusion into concrescence or living together. Here are three variations on this theme. Firstly, there is no justice without violence. There is always an injustice that triggers the question of justice and demands just structures, a just law, against which injustices can be weighed or pursued or redeemed. Even the notion of poetic justice so ingrained in our literature since Plato and in our culture demanding that someone has to pay the bill is in fact a memento mori for the ones who cannot speak anymore of the injustices done and encountered, who might not have any hope except through the poetic work of the cosmos. But this is, of course, as Whitehead reminds us already, an over-moralization of thought under the influence of fanaticism and pedantry. There is no poetic justice of this kind, except as lamentation from the depth of despair, de profundis clamavia te, from the depth we call to you. There is the violence of injustice and there is the violence of the law that is said to bring justice. But law never brings justice, only law again, and the violence of the law. Although it might be better than the ravaging of lawless powers, the law is still an expression of the will of the stronger. This was Thrasymachus' answer to Plato that Whitehead records and it is the conviction of many post-structuralists today that the law is begotten by a violence of repressive, repressive powers based on, as Derrida says, logocentric binaries that control the economies of rationality and relationality. The creation of the world is not per se the victory of persuasion over force. The world of civilized order, I fear, is based on violence. However, since such pervading violence is always unavoidable insofar as the orders, the orders it creates allow to at least some, for at least some cosmos to arise over against pure chaos, it cannot be eradicated from social construction. Yet it must always be countered by the non-violence of the love of multiplicity. In fact, it is only the counter-movement of polyphilia instead of counter-violence that the emergence of justice is generated within its powers of exclusion. It is, so to say, its nonviolent alternative. This poiesis does not create, but uncreate the order of things in light of the multiplicity that its founding violence has excluded. The world of civilized order only becomes persuasive, to use Whitehead's term again, if its self-constitution is undone by the love for its lost multiplicity. 
This, I take it, is the secret of living together justly, to always, without the promise of totality, uncreate orders, mirroring them with the impossible alternative of nonviolence. In striving beyond the vulgarities of praise or of power, it might become the imitation of divine rightness. And here, I cannot go further or even improve on the Sermon on the Mount. Secondly, justice is neither love nor power. It would, however, be too simple and convenient to assume that justice is the fusion of power and love. On the contrary, justice, it seems to me, is the impossible interval that always divides them infinitely. This distance does not make justice a mere ideal, rather it makes it urgent, as Derrida says. Drawing on the same text, Walter Benjamin's critique of violence, both Derrida and Butler name justice a messianic reality, a breaking in of a kind of divine violence, a violence against violence that harbors the nonviolent care for the sacred transience, the sacred transience of life and I might add of living together. Like Derrida's justice, it lives of poesis, that is, the deconstruction of the violent orders that generate our world through exclusion of its multiplicities. Poetic justice, like Derrida's justice, cannot be deconstructed, but is the mode of deconstruction in the urgency of living together. Thirdly, justice is tragic. As Reinhold Niebuhr observes justice is born out of decisions among disjunctive demands that cannot be satisfied together and at once. Justice always creates injustices. It is confronted with a multiplicity of powers and extraditions in their mutual exclusiveness. Justice is, so to say, the tragic side of polyphilic love because of the impossibility of living together in poetic nonviolence in the inherent conflicting divergencies of multiplicity. There are injustices that are so tragic that they cannot be matched with any justice. Here, the distance between destructive powers and polyphilia is so great that the only bridge remaining is the unbridgeable distance between them. Robert Nozick has made a case that with the Holocaust, humanity has lost any illusion to be considered the aim of cosmic evolution or divine desire. He writes that the Holocaust is such a massive cataclysm that it distorts everything around it. So that if human species, the human species were ended and obliterated now, he writes, it end would not longer constitute a special tragedy. We may take Adorno's warning seriously that poetry after Auschwitz is barbarism. Yet, poetics might be the only means fragile enough to preserve the injustice's memory of loss. Different trains, the piece you heard at the beginning, commemorizes voices of survivors, Holocaust survivors, in a piece of music. It takes not anything away from it. Poetic justice may, in that which cannot be bridged, save an irrevocable irrecoverable loss from its insignificance. If there is any procedure without external criteria by which we might characterize poetic justice, I find it in an adaptation of Whitehead's last lecture, Immortality. To imitate the other in their otherness as inherent moment of one's own self-constitution by uncovering the unbridgeable distance within it. In the imitation of theopoetic justice, neither creativity and poiesis, nor God and the world ever become united as totality. They remain in a process of a mutual delivery that characterizes the place where justice can occur. Its imitation creates distance that makes living together impossible as totality, but possible as process. If we finally ask, how a civilization that seeks itself in such an ecology of living together might look. I must appeal to the ignorance of process without totality. Let me, with a poem of Robinson Jeffers, the Californian prophet of post-human ecology, only anticipate three possible readings. Spirits and illusions have died, 
The naked mind lives in the beauty of the inanimate things. Flowers wither, grass fades, trees wilt, the forest is burnt, the rock is not burnt. The deer starve, the winter birds die on their twigs and lie in the blue dawns in the snow. Men suffer want and become curiously ennoble as prosperity made them curiously vile. But look how noble the world is. The lonely flowing waters, the secret keeping stones, the flowing sky. We might face the truth that living together is impossible or only possible in the naked mind, beauty, and grandeur of inanimate things. Civilized are maybe only the great cosmic societies that in their own rhythms neither want nor seek their own survival, the flow of rocks, waters, and skies. Maybe we must admit that we are only contingencies and disposable. Maybe we must seek to open a wound in the midst of our own possessive insignificance that makes space for their rightness. Maybe such a wound is what civilization means, like John Muir's necessity of wildness, and maybe even like Edward Abbey's ecocide. Or maybe we need to become desert again and encounter the desert's God. Alternatively, a civilization might take the urge of nonviolence so seriously that it tries to minimize the impacts on the environments it touches. We might imagine that if such a civilization could emerge at all, it would, only have, it would not only have come to terms with its own recycling of life and death, but would end up leaving all environments as if it has never touched them. Thought to its very end, it might just disappear through the cracks in space and time without leaving any trace, leaving behind only the naked mind of inanimate things, unimpressed by the cycles of becoming and perishing. But maybe we could read Schaeffer's poem backwards, from the naked mind into the curious strangeness of the organic film on its surface. Maybe we need not to save nature after all, since it is its patience that has brought us into existence. Maybe the universe is not as cold and cruel after all, but a gift, offering a new possibility beyond mere greatness and the cruelties of mere survival. We can love or hate. We can feel beauty or destruction. We can become artists or warriors. We can create significance or just die but we might be unable to do justice to their gift because we feel them to be in the grip of a blind fate instead of the rightness that we contribute to and it contributes to us. I do not know where we will go, in which of these directions, if in any, if at all. What I believe is that we need, we cannot do without the recognition of some kind of cosmic virtue that lives in the conflicts of creativeness and destructiveness of orders and the exclusion and invitation of a vastness of multiplicity beyond. I hope that this character is what makes the memory of greatness and the forgiveness of violent, cruel destructions, or conversely, the memory of the destructed and the greatness of forgiveness meaningful. Even if our little lives and the universe we stare at or with awe or distaste of its uncertain significance might become nothing but a ripple barely indistinguishable from nothingness. I don't know, but it might be up to us to render such a thought a virtue. Please join me again in gratitude to Professor Roland Faber. I am Vance Martin, a trustee of the Claremont School of Theology.
And on behalf of our president, Jerry Campbell, who, as you know, under different circumstances, would not have missed this evening. And on behalf of this community of scholars and teachers and learners and seekers, administrators and supporters, those who are possessed of inspiration and consternation and indeed hope, I thank on your behalf Professor Roland Faber for his gift to us this evening. I thank you for being here. His gift in honor of the poetics of the life of John B. Cobb, Jr. Enabled by the faithful stewardship on behalf of this school of Mary Ellen Kilsby and her family. Thank you again. Please join us for the reception. Please enjoy yourselves and reflect upon the evening.